And we are white against a 2350. Okay, so this is going to be a serious game. Let's go for d4. Let's go for d4. And you know what? I feel like playing in Jababa London. We're playing a very serious opponent, so I'm going to play something that I personally am comfortable with, which is a Jababa London. And at this level, I think it's still quite effective and not as well known. You might remember that we have had one Jababa London in the speedrun, which was pretty successful. Um, I was better out of the opening. Let's see how this one turns out. A6. So A6 is a first tier. Lion Black has maybe three or four uh, legitimate ways to meet the move Bishop F4. There's C5. There's Bishop F5, the symmetrical line. There's the conservative line with E6. There's g6, and there is a6. a6 is a totally sensible move. It prevents knight b5, which is one of the main ideas of the Jababa London. And we respond with the sort of pedestrian e3. Uh, and here we know that black can develop the bishop to f5, black can play c5. Yeah, the hypermodernists are, are all... <laughs> we're all laughed out of the room when they suggested that knight c3 is a move. e6 is also a totally legitimate possibility. And now we continue developing our pieces in, again, relatively mundane fashion. There is uh, a very interesting sideline here. You can play the immediate g4, exploiting the fact that the bishop is now closed off and g4 is not defended. But we're going to play this in a uh, strictly positional fashion. And we're going to start with a move bishop d3. Yeah, this guy has a really, really good rapid re rapid record. I think he's won every game he's played, but we'll do our best. Bishop d6. So already we are confronted with a dilemma. We essentially have three options, one of which we can rule out. I don't like the possibility of bishop takes d6 because it allows black to play c takes d6 and establish a central pawn mass. We can play bishop g3, and most of you know that bishop g3 is a commonly accepted way to play in such a position, but if you've paid attention to my previous speedrun game in the Jababa, you might remember that there is nothing to be afraid of in the bishop takes f4, e takes f4 pawn structure. We can continue developing normally, because after bishop f4, e f4, yes, the f pawns are doubled, but your control over the center increases. You get this, you can think of it almost as a reverse Morozzi bind. Uh, we bind on the e5 square, and this is absolutely nothing to be afraid of. Black castles, we can castle ourselves. And you very often get a standoff in this line where both sides kind of maneuver around uh, the two bishops which are staring at each other. But of course, you know, bishop takes f4 for black is fine, especially if it's followed up by a timely c5, striking at the center and uh, essentially removing one of the two pawns that create the bind. Black goes b6. Yeah, and now we establish a Pillsbury Knight. So just like in the regular London, in the Jababa London, White's play very frequently revolves around establishing a Knight on E5. And putting the Knight on E5 does a couple of things. The Knight is just inherently a very good piece. But in addition, we create a pathway for one of our other pieces. All of a sudden, we can already create pretty decent attacking chances against Black Seeing, at least... Uh, at least if, if black misplays this, it, the way our opponent is playing this is fine. But this is an idea you have to know if you're a London player. What are we maneuvering and to what square are we maneuvering it? Yeah, queen f3. We start with the move queen f3. And from f3, the queen can swing either to g3 to x-ray the g-pun or more prominently to h3 in order to create big time pressure against the h7 pawn now h7 is protected by the knight but the knight on f6 is far from an invulnerable piece knight b to d7 by our opponent good play very good play Let me, let's see yeah this guy has a very very good record 26 and 2 Woo! okay hopefully it's not carlson the big question here is queen g3 or queen h3 yeah i like queen h3 because it is more uh, there's more meat on the bone with this move because we are actually pressuring a pawn that if we win results in immediate checkmate and we are inducing a weakening move which our opponent has just played the move g6 creates uh rather prominent holes on the king side on h6 and on g5 which we can try to exploit with further maneuvering play 
how are we going to try to exploit Black's kingside weaknesses? Give me a second to think about it. I have a couple of ideas, but I know this guy is very serious, so I'm going to try to play as objectively as possible. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is I would love to play bishop h6 and f4, but after bishop h6, I'm worried about the exchange sacrifice, knight takes c5. Black gets a ton of compensation there uh, for the exchange, so I don't want to move the bishop away from f4 unless... We move it to g5, which is actually a viable continuation. Bishop g5, sacrificing a pawn on e5, and then pushing the pawn up to f4. In that line, we're banking everything on the pin against the knight. Also, a little bit too speculative. What other moves can we propose? Well, we can think about the move queen h6, but that seems a little bit aimless, and I'm pretty sure that the queen can be easily chased out of h6. We can also remove our knight from e5 and basically say, well, the knight has done its job. Now we're going to head to g5 to pressure uh, the h7 pawn again. Hmm. Okay, I know what I like. Let's play a positional move that, again, if you're experienced in the Jababa London, you know about this idea. You move the knight away from c3. And then you always try to transpose this into a traditional London by pushing the pawn up to c3, which is, of course, a much healthier central pawn formation than having the knight on c3. That is the main drawback of the Jabal London. That knight on c3 blocks the c-pawn, and in many cases allows black to harass the d4-pawn via c7, c5. So we're making surface-level improvements to our pawn structure. You might ask, well, what about the knight on e2? What are we going to do with it? I don't know yet. Maybe we'll move the bishop away and make space for it on f4. Maybe we'll maneuver it to g3, although that's pretty unlikely. I don't know what it'll be doing on g3. Yeah, the knight is going to be uh, a flaw in our position that we're going to try to address later on. Our last move was knight c3 to e2. I would definitely guess that this is not the top engine move, but I think it's, it's simple and practical. It's simple and practical. All right, we are waiting for our opponent's response to this move. What I'm worried about in this position, I'm worried about one move in particular, which is knight h5. I am a little bit concerned about the move knight h5 because it targets our bishop. And again, if we play bishop h6, which a lot of you are probably thinking, why not bishop h6? Black has this annoying exchange sacrifice. Knight e5, de, bishop e5, we take on f8. Black takes back, and for the exchange, black has a pawn and a big, big time pawn mass in the center. Black will play c5 and e5, and I'll show this after the game. Uh, that line seems pretty unappetizing to me. So after knight h5, we can choose to ignore, and we can just continue on with our plan. We can play c3. And of course, then we are intending to meet knight takes f4, once again with e takes f4. Okay, knight h5 is on the board, and probably that is the most practical continuation. I think the most practical continuation here is just to play c3 and to continue with our initial idea. And if black wants to trade, then we take back with a pawn, and once again, then we have a pure Pillsbury knight on e5, which is a very, very strong piece. So I think this is totally fine for white. f5. Okay, that I did not expect. That I did not expect. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't expect it because it, it. I mean, it weakens, or it seems to weaken the king side. But now that I look at it more carefully, I think this is actually a very strong move. Okay, so why is this a strong move? It basically puts a blanket over the entire king side. It blocks my bishop. It blocks my queen. It clamps down on white's king side pieces, and it makes the whole situation on the king side rather claustrophobic. So because it's so claustrophobic, it might be a good opportunity for us to just trade a bunch of pieces. Knight takes d7. Then maybe we can reshuffle our bishop to h6 and bring the other knight to f4. That would be an interesting idea. Uh, g4, I think, is a little bit too risky after knight takes f4. I think creating these kingside weaknesses is it's too much. I think g4, my intuition, is kind of rejecting. Hmm. Well, bishop h6, again, he's got the exchange sacrifice. 
Okay, let's go for it. Let's play knight takes d7. I hate to trade, you know, it tears my heart out to trade a knight like that. But it also unburdens our position, allows more mobility for the bishop. So we're going to go bishop h6. We're not going to trade the bishops. Again, I, I didn't want to trade the dark squared bishop be bishops because after c takes d6, we're helping black establish better control of the center. Rook f7. And now I think it's a perfect opportunity for knight f4. We have solved the problem of the knight. The problem is that our opponent is going to play knight f6, would be my guess. And from f6, the knight is aiming for g4 and potentially for e4. So what move naturally comes to mind after knight f6? Yeah, f3. f3 is more or less a no-brainer. We have to try to restrict the knight on f6. The problem is that black can now counter-strike in the center with e5. And e5 basically forces us to give up our d4 pawn. Not give up as in sacrifice, give up as in trade. Uh, because moving the knight from f4 would make very little sense. We just made all this effort to put our knight on f4. Now moving it away would be kind of weird. So let's take it. Now, the situation has changed. Our pawn is no longer on d4. Mostly that's a bad thing. But there is one... Uh, good byproduct of that. What is the good thing that's co that's come up that we can try to exploit that good thing with our next move? Well, the the d file opens up, and later on down the line we can try to put pressure on the d5 pawn. And so I think it's natural to bring the rook into the game, rook a to d1. Then maybe we can move the bishop away from d3. Maybe we can play bishop c2, and potentially we can maneuver the bishop to b3, and just put light pressure on the d5 pawn. Nothing major. The d5 pawn is incredibly well protected, but we can try to make black a little bit uncomfortable, especially if black plays c5, which I don't think he will. The problem with the move c5 here is that black forfeits the opportunity to secure the d5 pawn with c6. Pawns don't go backwards. But black also probably won't play c6 too quickly because that closes out the bishop completely. So our next move is very likely to be bishop c2. We also have a store of, you know, small improving moves like king h1, queen h4. Like, if we have the time for that, we'll go for it. Rook e8 is a great move, bringing the rook into the game. Um, I'm slightly worried that the e3 pawn is a serious weakness. Now, one tactical observation that I'm going to make here is that in most cases, rook takes e3 is not really a possibility because it runs into tactics along this diagonal. Like knight takes g6 could be a very effective answer to rook takes e3. So I'm not terrified of losing our e3 pawn. With that being said, it might be a good idea for us to shift our rook to e1 just for overprotection's sake. I think we should start with bishop c2, though. This seems like the most flexible move. We are opening up a channel, a line of negotiation between the rook and the queen, and our opponent drops the queen back. But, as I just pointed out, I think this offers us a nice opportunity to complete the maneuver and press down on the d5 pawn. A bishop b3 makes perfect sense here. Bishop g5 also makes a lot of sense, by the way, with the idea of taking the knight and taking the pawn. So from a certain point of view, bishop g5 might be even more flexible, but... Yeah, we're going to go with our plan of bishop b3. We, maybe we can play bishop g5 on the next move. Okay, c6. Now, that is a pretty serious concession. That is a pretty serious concession. It weakens black's position. It closes the bishop. I like that we've managed to induce c4. Let's keep the ball rolling here. It, it feels natural to me now to play the move bishop g5. I don't know exactly why, but maybe putting a little bit more pressure on the knight is, is going to put more strain on black's position overall. So we can play rook e1, but I like to move bishop g5. What I also like about this move is that it discourages black from doubling on the e-file. Why does it discourage black? Because doubling the e-file runs into the pin along this diagonal. We can follow up with queen h4 attacking the knight directly. So bishop g5 is just one of those slow moves where we're trying to increase our general control over the position, make our opponent a little bit more uncomfortable. Okay, I also wasn't expecting that. That's a big concession because black's dark squares 
are incredibly weak here. So it's not a given that we should recapture with the bishop. There is a case to be made for taking back with a pawn. The drawback of taking with a pawn is very obvious, right? Well, first of all, we move a pawn from the center. Second of all, the bishop on g5 is essentially locked in prison. It can't go back. But maybe it doesn't need to go back, right? g5 is a phenomenal square for the bishop, and maybe it can just chill on g5 for the rest of the game, basically. Um, I quite like the look of e takes f4, actually. I like both moves. I think white is better in both cases. Bishop takes f4 is the conventional move. It's the safe move. But there's just something charming about e takes f4. Maybe it'll backfire terribly. Maybe it'll backfire terribly. Let me think about this for a second. Just give me, give me a moment. I really don't know. I really, really don't know. I'm going to take with the bishop, though. Let's be conservative this game. But we're playing a very strong opponent. After the game, we'll investigate pawn takes. My intuition is that pawn takes is a much better move than it looks like. But bishop takes is, is sort of, you know, straight laced. And we're going to play straight lace style in this game. And probably regret it once we lose. It's not about being a scaredy cat. It's not like a, it's not a, he takes f4 is not a sacrifice. You know, it's not like you, you know, you demonstrate your bravery by playing that move. It's just a purely positional question. I, it's not really about even taking a risk. Queen e6 is good. Yeah. Okay. Rook f1 makes a lot of sense here. Let's solidify our pawn. Okay. Knight h5. Yeah. So of course we shouldn't give away our bishop is our only and main asset. The only question is, should we play bishop g5 or should we play bishop h6? Bishop g5 obviously looks a lot more natural. But the good thing about bishop h6 is that it, it essentially holds the king down and it prepares this move e4. Hmm, another very difficult dilemma here. What ultimately sways me... No, I don't know what sways me. Bishop g5 is interesting. Bishop h6 is interesting. Let's go to h6. Let's go to h6. What I like about, yeah, what, what does sway me is that it, it, it keeps the king on the 8th rank. So we open up the possibility of some e4 ideas. If we can open up the center, the fact that black's king is on, stuck on a back rank, there's like back rank threats, that could be valuable. c5. Okay. e4 looks really good to me, but I haven't really investigated it carefully. I really like the look of e4. Just blast open the center because we have the bishop pair. We have better control over the position in general. Right? I think it's time for a pawn break. I think it's time for a pawn break. There's also some variations to calculate here, which I've kind of done. Yeah, f takes e4 I thought was bad. So now what we do is we take the queen. We have to. And here we need to spend a couple of moments. Because... Rook takes c4 is a possibility. Bishop takes d5 is a possibility. Even rook takes d5 is a possibility. I think we're winning if we find the right approach. So let me pause here to reflect for a moment. So f takes c4. He probably goes rook f7. Don't like it. Ah, but then we go rook f1. Let me go rook f1. Looks pretty good, actually. Rook takes c4, rook takes c4, f takes c4, c4, we have bishop takes c4. Ooh. Gosh, it's so hard to make this decision. Well, I'll talk after the game why this is so difficult. I'm trying to calculate my way out of this. I really like the look of rook takes d5, actually. But then he takes, takes rook e5. I have a feeling f4 is the best move. I just have an intuition that it's the best move because it keeps the most amount of pieces on the board. It keeps the maximum amount of pieces on the board. And that's what we basically have to try to do here. Okay, let's go FE. Let's go FE. Yeah, and C4 I thought was a blunder. C4 I think is a blunder. Who can tell me why? I think C4 is a mistake. Who can tell me why? Actually, there's many reasons. <laughs> this is a really bad move, and it's impulsive. Yeah, bishop takes c4 is the simplest move. That's the one we're going to play. 
Even E takes D5, I think, works in exactly the same way. Rookie one, rookie one, and you're threatening mate on E8. Let me just make sure that bishop takes C4 is the best move, because we're... If we win this game, this guy is good. This will be a, a pretty nice win. Okay, bishop c4, rookie 7. Again, we can go rook f1, and okay, our opponent just resigns. Our opponent just resigns. After bishop c4, the game is over. After bishop c4, the game is over. Let's take a look at it. It's a surprisingly short game, 27 moves. And that was a tremendous amount of complexity for a game that short. There were tons of decisions we had to make, and I'm pretty happy with how we made them. Okay, so Jabal London, Bishop F4. You, you, If you want a, a more basic introduction to this opening, you can look at my previous Jabal London speedrun video, uh, which was around the time we were 1900. And yeah, A6 is considered to be one of the most reputable responses to the Jabal, E3 and E6, totally normal. Bishop d3, bishop d6. Of course, black can also play the immediate c5. You can take a look at this yourself if you want a line with black against Jabal. But bishop d6 is is fine. Although I think I think c5 is a little bit more accurate. After bishop d6, the engine starts giving a, a, a small edge for white. So maybe this doesn't equalize completely. Essentially, if you're playing this line... Um... Gary, I'll talk about that line afterwards. If you're playing this line, then it makes sense to play it without a6, right? e6 saves the tempo. Of course, after e6, there is knight b5, and perhaps this is why black played a6, but the tempo was spent in a questionable way. So castles, castles, b6. Yeah, and now we play in very traditional fashion, knight e5, queen f3. This is all very straightforward. And bd7. I still see a game in the database here. And queen h3 makes perfect sense to me. g6. And this is sort of the first critical position. I'm not totally happy with the decision I ended up making. I would be very curious to see what the engine recommends here. I can sense that white is better. Um, okay, so I turned the engine on, by the way. Full disclosure. Yeah, I see what the move is. Yeah, knight e2 is definitely a mistake. After knight h5, we lose all of our advantage. Or maybe not all of it. Maybe white is still a tad, tad bit better. But it's it's definitely inaccurate. Um, okay, so before we get there, this is an interesting position. If black plays knight e4, and this is a very common way to try to address the knight on e5, you, you put a knight on the equivalent square. Here, white simply has f3. That's the main calling card of putting the queen on h3. It's to meet knight e4 with f3, and obviously... The knight just has to return to f6, which is a disastrous loss of tempo. After knight e f6, we already have the devastating move bishop g5, threatening to take one knight, then the other knight, and then mate him on h7. If h6, we take on d7, we take on f6, and we take on h6. So black cannot afford to just give up to tempi here. Bishop g5 is a very serious threat in this position. So from that perspective, g6 makes sense. h6 would have also made a lot of sense. But here, black would have had to reckon with the bishop sacrifice on h6. In my experience, in these positions, this sacrifice usually works. And one of the main reasons that it works is that if black takes twice on e5, we drop our queen back to g5 at a minimum, and we can win the bishop back. Probably f4 wins even faster because this rook lift is totally devastating. So the sack on h6 looks very, very strong here. Um... You want to hear something crazy? After bishop takes e5, I, I'm looking at the engine eval. d takes e5 is plus one, but there is a move here that's plus four, and it's absolutely amazing. I'll let you guys try to guess. If you're watching this on YouTube, pause the video, try to guess the right move. It's logical. It makes logical sense, but it's still a pretty awesome move. f4, yeah, very good. f4. f4. What is the idea? Why are you sending the bishop back? Now you sack on g7, and the idea shines through, but not just yet. Most people would play rook f3 here. Rook f3 loses the game. After rook g8, the king escapes via f8. So what is the technique for not allowing that? You use your queen to shepherd black's king uh, onto a more vulnerable square. You start with a check. 
Now it's zigzag time. Notice the roll of the bishop preventing knight h7. Continuing the zigzag, finishing the zigzag, and now we play rook f3, and the king cannot escape through f8 because the queen controls it. Beautiful sequence. Is that a beautiful sequence? First you play f, let me do that again. First you play f, you sack on h6. Then you do not recapture the knight. Then you sack on g7. You zigzag all the way to h6, and you lift the rook up with mate. Just an amazing line. Uh, so for that reason, g6 is a very sensible move. So the engine move here is pure prophylaxis. Um, I've made this point many times before that when you hear the term engine move, right, a move that you don't understand, it's generally because the move prevents something and that something might be a very subtle idea. In this case, it's not a subtle idea. Black wants to play knight h5. He's not making any bones about that. Knight h5 is a big positional threat. We decided to allow it, uh, and we took the hit, but white doesn't have to take the hit. The move is not g4. g4 is too weakening. g4 could be met with knight e4. And, and notice how you've weakened all these dark squares. Too many weaknesses around your king. A much more graceful prophylactic move is just bishop drops back to e2, stopping knight h5 that way. This is the top move. Uh, a valuable thing to know is that in these types of positions, c5 is almost never possible because of this very simple tactic. Knight f7 and bishop d6. The bishop on d6 is only defended by the pawn. So the knight on d7 obstructs the queen. Black has a hard time finding a move here. White is totally dominating all of the key squares. Black's king side is sort of in shambles. White is better. It's plus, plus 0.5 or so. Yeah, the top move here is 98. That's not the easiest move to play. Then we can bring our rook into the game. And if black... Okay, black can't even play f6 because he drops the pawn. So this is a this is a tricky position for black to navigate. Notice how one prophylactic move like that would have really changed the nature of the position. I played 92. After knight h5, black breathes a big sigh of relief. C3. Yeah, so f5, I didn't expect at all. And in retrospect, I think this might be an inaccuracy. I think the problem with f5 is that it creates tons of holes on the king side that black didn't really need to create. I think black should have just taken on f4. He takes f4. And now a very instructive moment. Let's say you're playing black here. Big question. Do you take on e5 or not? What's the answer? Think about that for a second. Do we take on e5 or not? I like it when the crowd is divided because that tells me there is an instructive point to be made. So the answer is no, at least in my opinion. I don't think it loses. Again, when I say no, does it lose the game? No. But this structure, you have to be very, very careful about because white has a devastating plan in these types of positions that comes really quickly and it's incredibly destructive. And that plan is to play f4, g4 and f5 and smash through on the king side with unbelievable force notice that black doesn't really have counterplay on the other side of the board this bishop is just a lame duck uh and and we have an, an amazingly well defended pawn structure f4 f4 let's say black plays c5 which is like a typical response right then we play g4 if cd we can play cd we can even play knight takes d4 probably even better because we can we attack the e6 pawn f5 is coming next and black's king side is is just totally falling apart totally falling apart um let me see if i can find some games with this plan in action uh this is a very very widespread ubiquitous plan so this is almashi against vavra almashi later became a very strong gm from hungary he was hungarian number one so we have a French, right? And this structure originates mostly out of the French, which makes a lot of sense, right? Literally in the French, you get the structure out of the opening. So watch what Almashi does here. He goes knight g5, h6, queen h5, attacking f7, and inducing g6. Notice that. Queen drops back. The knight is just chilling on g5. It doesn't have to move. Bishop is deployed to a3. Black plays a5. And watch what Almashi does here. Black's structure looks very, very solid. Bang. Bang. Now, rook a, b1. Attacking b6, inducing knight b5. You take on e7 to force the king out. 
and f5 anyway f5 anyway because h takes g5 runs into f6 winning the rook and then winning the knight on b5 later if black tries to get away by sacking an exchange you're not just sacking an exchange you're also losing your knight at the end of the line that's why white played rook b1 so black is just getting totally destroyed here he tried knight takes c3 but after the f file is open and the b file is open there's too many things to defend rook comes to f6 takes on e6 and now the final move of the game is queen b2 the king is toast after rook b6 queen b6 and so black resigned in that position post stick thank you for the prime not the not the best example i could have showed but you know it's the best i could find in 10 seconds let's go back to the speedrun game hopefully you have added a new plan to your sort of mental database which is what you have to do uh is is keep learning new structures and the typical plans in those structures okay so for that reason in this position you do not want to take on e5 and i would advocate for a move like c5 now you might say well wait a second doesn't white have the same plan here can't white play g4 and then f5 it ain't that easy with this knight still sitting on e5 let's make a random move f5 at this point is just a terrible move because you give up the pawn and white's not getting anywhere with the king side attack so for that reason you want to keep the knight alive on e5 does that make sense so i think this position is about equal you know black has the two bishops black has some pressure in the center white has i would prefer white we have a nice knight we have a very safe position but it's hard for either side here to really make a lot of progress so f5 i think is a step in the wrong direction we decided to meet it by taking on d7 another important moment occurred here uh, another important moment occurred here queen takes d7 is not forced black has a second option to take on f4 first should he have done that i think the answer is yes i think giving us the opportunity to conserve our dark squared bishop one could argue is what won us the game that bishop landed on h6 at the end, and it is because it kept the king under lock and key that black suffered when the center opened up. So I, I actually think black should have taken on f4. I don't know what we would have taken back with. Probably the pawn, again leading to an important structure where these pawns are holding back the e6 pawn. I call this the Botvinnik structure. I call this the Botvinnik structure, a situation where the opposing side has a backward pawn and we have one or two pawns that are holding it back preventing it from moving and of course the plan uh is to pile up the pressure on the e6 pawn but it's hard for us to do that because this knight is in the way and to move the knight you have to defend f4 and black can easily defend e6 50 different ways black can play freaking rook e8 and bishop c8 and rook f6 Nonetheless, uh, this is an important plan to be aware of. Since we're on the topic, let me show you why I call it the Botvinnik plan. There's a famous game that's shown to a lot of Russian schoolboys. Botvinnik, 16-year-old Botvinnik against Holodkevich. I might have shown this on stream before. So Botvinnik faces a strong Soviet master. So you have a pretty regular accelerated dragon position. And in this position, Botvinnik initiates a series of trades. He plays knight d5. There's a trade on d5. Black is like, la da la da da just trade everything. And strikes with b5. Now, what similarity can you notice between the speedrun game and this position? Well, it's the fact that black has this e7 pawn that is held back by the pawn on d5. And so Botvinnik carries out a very textbook plan that involves piling up with everything that he's got on the e-file and of course, combining that with pressure on the queen side. First, you give a check. So he decides to trade on b5 in order to give himself a pawn majority on the queen side. That pawn majority is ultimately going to win him the game. Ultimately, it's going to win him the game. Now he goes rookie one, rookie three, a4, combining queen side and king side play, double on the e file and tie black down keep the pawn rolling b4 is a great move what is his idea on queen takes a4 it's not rook takes e7 it's to play rook a1 and bishop f1 winning the bishop on a6 notice how he uses tactics to make stuff work bishop b7 b5 b6 so he's tied black down 
against the e-pawn. Now he makes progress on the queen side. He trades off black's only active piece, the other rook. You can't take on a5 because rook c7 wins the bishop. So he trades off black's last remaining active piece. Black tries to get the rook to the c file. No, no, no. Get back to defending the e-pawn. I'm the one who's going to get control of the c file. Rook c8 is forced. And now the decisive combination. You trade it. And who can find essentially the what should have been the final move of the game? Black played on for a few more moves. But this should have been the final move of the game. Beautiful little combination. Check. Weaponized queen trade. If black doesn't take... Then we take and go b7, promoting. If black does take, that opens up the bishop, which has been patiently waiting, by the way, for the entire game to have its moment in the sun. Now it has its moment in the sun, supporting b7, and black resigned here. The a pawn literally promotes. Actually, one of my favorite kind of textbook positional classic games that is not shown enough, a good illustration of working against weak pawns. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Bobbin against Holovkevich. You could take down the names, opponent's names and you could look at it yourself later. You could just Google it. What differentiates the speedrun position from the Bobbinic positions? Well, there's confounding factors, right? There is a weakness that White has, which is F4. Black has a lot more defensive machinery at his disposal. And so for that, posi for that reason, I think White's edge here is not insignificant, but pretty small. By the way, white also has this interesting idea, and the engine gives this idea of moving the king to h1 and then maneuvering the knight to e5. There's a beautiful juicy square on e5. We can try to get our knight there. White is better here, but the advantage is limited. I think after queen d7, bishop h6, black's position is already very, very unpleasant. Knight f4 is very nice. We get our knight to a good square. Now compare this position, compare this position with... Uh, you know, this position. It's similar pawn structure, but there we have a bishop rather than a knight. And the bishop does a great job uh, disrupting the coordination of black's pieces. And here it's much easier to get our rooks doubled much faster. So black is in trouble in this position. Knight f6 makes sense. And now f3 to restrict the knight. e5 makes sense again. Takes, takes. Rook ad1, bringing the rook into the game and adapting to the new set of circumstances. The center has opened. We now have to reorient our pieces appropriately. Rook e 8 Isn't our bishop blocked? Well, it's the sort of, you know, Norwegian prison situation where, yeah, the bishop is confined uh, to two squares, but its influence is still tremendous. It's like Jean-Paul Marat. You know, he's confined to his bathtub, but he's still dictating the course of the French Revolution. The bishop is controlling f8, and it's defending the f-pawn, so we don't have to worry about this. And if we later play g4, then the bishop is going to be a participant in the attack. You should read about him if you don't know. Kind of a cool story. Rook a e1, and rook e3, and rook e1 is coming, and the bishop is, is, is doing its part. Knight f6, f3. So e5, d, e, d, e, we get a rook into the game, rook e8, and bishop c2. Our new plan is to put pressure slash attack the d5 pawn. And we did that with the move bishop b3. c6 is a serious concession, and now we drop the other bishop back to put pressure on the knight. I think bishop takes f4 is nearly the decisive mistake. Yeah, e, I was right. e takes f4 is the best move. We should have gone for this, this or at least on a low depth, Okay, what we can say is it's not a bad move. Now it's changing its mind and saying bishop f4 is better. But they're approximately equivalent. Uh, Girondin. Yeah, she was Charlotte. See, I, I remember something from school. Um, the point of he takes f4 is to open up the e-file, obviously. Why is white the one who benefits from opening up the e-file, even though black is already the one with a rook on e8? Well, the reason is that we're going to play rook fe1 in the next move. Let's make a random move by white, by black. And this is where the bishop on g5 comes in. Black cannot contest the e-file with rook f e7 because he drops the knight. Now you could say, well, no problem. Let's just move the knight first. Well, if you move the knight, then you still can't go rook e7 because now the bishop is controlling that square. Let's make another random move by black. How can white fight for control of the e-file? Well, we have a beautiful defended square on e5. We can play rook e5. 
and rook d e1 and we're starting to encircle black's pieces does that make sense so ef4 is a very deep move and it would have been an interesting try but we took with the bishop okay queen e6 rook f e1 knight h5 and bishop back to h6 creating the conditions that make e4 successful okay c5 and e4 strike striking in the center now this is where black made the actual decisive mistake f takes e4 just loses the game and black played too quickly it turns out that after c4 black is actually still all right i will be totally honest i kind of forgot that after e takes d5 black has queen takes e1 check and the interesting thing is that this position still looks winning for white this position still looks winning for white why does it look winning for white because the rook is hanging and if black moves the rook we take on c4 what do we have for the two rooks we have a queen we have these two pawns and we're basically going to go d6 on the next move and you know make make kebab out of black's position but there is a subtlety that i missed after king f2 black has a winning move who can find it pause the video if you're watching on youtube find black's winning move these things happen out of nowhere c takes b3 exactly c takes b3 and after king a1 b a2 you know white's pieces are all on the other side of the board black promotes such a frustrating and such a coincidence if the pawn is on a3 this wouldn't work my right, chess is such a crazy game so white has to take but now black goes rook f e7 with checkmate on top of everything else um so for this reason after c4 we would have had to drop our bishop back to c2 i think practically speaking white is still much better and again just so everybody's on the same page what makes black's position so difficult here is that he cannot take on e4 because black gets mated that's partially mostly why we put the bishop on h6 in order to make this impossible for black uh but black black has a hard time finding a move here because now we're threatening to take one of these pawns probably black has to play d e f e and now the engine gives some weird move knight g7 that's not an easy move to play knight f6 is a little bit more human but now we push the pawn up to e5 knight g4 bishop f4 and this is of course a lot more palatable for black than the game continuation but still we're going to move our queen away from h3 then we're going to push the pawn to h3 and the knight's going to have problems positions like these are very very hard to handle for humans positions with a lot of weak squares and a weak color complex notice that all of black's dark squares are suffering because of the absence of a dark squared bishop so let's just confirm that i made the right decision in this position i did f takes c4 is the best move so what was i you know agonizing over i had three candidate moves the th four candidate moves there's bishop d5 there's rook takes d5 which is interesting there's f e4 and there's rook takes d4 let me tell you exactly why i ruled out the other three rook takes d5 i almost went for because it's a sexy move it looks sleek and the idea is that after bishop d5 bishop d5 rook e5 we have what looks like a beautiful move white has rook takes e4 forcing a transition into a knight versus bishop endgame because rook d5 gets mated i was attracted to this but let's keep calculating after rook e4 f e4 looks like everything's in order black's king is paralyzed everything's great but knight f6 is an illusion shattering move it attacks the bishop you if you want you can drop the bishop back but you can't actually attack the rook so black is more than fine with this arrangement and if you take then the e4 pawn is now a sitting duck we literally white is not better anymore and here white is probably worse because black's king is closer to the center so this is the line that reject that explains why i rejected rook d5 um i i mean i saw up to knight f6 i saw up to knight f6 and i stopped there bishop takes d5 is better than rook takes d5 but after takes 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 black has rook fe7 i thought and the best that white can do is a pawn up end game which i wasn't totally convinced by uh rook d8 there's rook e8 that's the reason black plays rook e7 i stopped calculating here the engine gives rook e4 rook e4 fe4 and apparently after rook e4 there's this move rook d6 skewering the pawns along the sixth rank it's plus 1.5 white is better but it's just a pawn it's just a pawn um so the last move that i thought about is rook takes e4 
This move was the second best, and I almost played it. Rook takes e4, f takes e4, c4. Same thing as in the game. White has bishop takes e4. So I think this would have been very, very similar. Rook takes e4, the engine gives rook f to e7, which is the additional resource that black would not have had after f takes e4. Takes, 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 and white is up of pawn for no compensation. And black's king is in trouble because it's confined to its quarters. So rook e4 would have been good. We played the simple move. And after c4, black resigned. Bishop c4 is game over. We just win all the pawns. Um... The only move to stay in the game, according to the engine, was something weird, rook d7. And now I was planning rook f1. In fact, I was expecting rook f e7, but rook f1 is a crusher because it threatens man on f8 and moves the rook away from the e-file. What effect does that have? Well, it makes e takes d5 possible. In this position, e d5 would have been impossible because this is a check. If this weren't a check, white would have d6. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't play the move. Black resigned beforehand. But rook f e7, rook f1 threatens mate, and black is getting torn apart here. I mean, we're just like, we're just destroying black here, 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 here. This is, this is, the position plays itself at this point. So that's why I spent, you know, a hefty amount of time on FD. I was calculating all of this, and this, this basically just finishes the game. And that's that. 27 moves, black resigned after c4. Again, we would have played bishop c4, taking is impossible because of mate in two. And if black doesn't take, then on the next move we take on d5. We're two pawns up, and we're still mating the king by getting our rook to e8. Yeah, very pretty, and, and I think a very, very high-quality game. I'm pretty happy with my decision-making. The move I'm not happy with is 92. I At least I chose the right square. Bishop e2 prophylaxis in critical moments. And for our opponent, his mistake was, first of all, to leave the bishop alive. Black had two opportunities to take the bishop out of the game, right? Here and even here, black could have played knight takes f4. Get, giving the bishop a new lease on life is really what lost black the game. And the second thing I'd say is black played very well in this stretch. Perhaps giving up the bishop is another inaccuracy. Not perhaps, it definitely is. Black should play... For example, knight d7, knight c5, the position is still close to equal. Although white plays c4, and this is unpleasant for sure, practically speaking. Uh, and then the decisive mistake, the mistake that actually lost the game was fe. After c4, black is still very much in the game, especially if he's careful. You suggested king h1 as a Canada move. Why was that? The king h1 that I mentioned was, was here. King g1 to h1, or is that the one you're talking about, Kavita? Yeah, it's to, it's to pave the way it's to pave the way for the maneuver of the knight to e5. And the interesting thing that I could do is I could I could show you a million games with this exact maneuver. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, wrong game. Sorry, not this one. I mean, in this one, white white does this. So this maneuver has been known since like, like the 1800s. King h1, knight g1, knight f3, and eventually the knight gets to e5. Here is another game where both sides do the same thing. Rubenstein, of course, incredibly strong. So white plays king h1. Black plays knight e4. Queen e1, king h8. Knight g1, knight g8. Knight f3, knight f6. Of course, black's idea is different from white's. Black's idea is to replace one of the knights with the other knight. But eventually, black got, white got the better of Akiba Rubenstein. Bishop c1. Opening up the pathway for the rook to h3. God, oh, this is really cool. Okay, he went back to f3, though. And eventually, he just created total... Wow. What a game! This is awesome. Def Look at the final combination. Look at what he did here. Bishop b1, queen c3, creating the battery. Bishop a2, which is probably unnecessary, but still takes takes and d5. Cool stuff. So, since this king h1, knight g1 maneuver is very common when you have a weak e5 squared access. My hope of these games isn't to belabor the point, it's to make sure that you have an easier time remembering, you know, these various ideas. So, on that note, folks, I think we're going to end the speedrun. Thank you for watching, and I'll be back with more chess tomorrow. Bye.